Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> At least here. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> nice hot day in Chicago. Yeah. Um, okay, so today we have got somebody that I've wanted to have on this show forever. Mm. I don't know why we have him. Larry Jordan, where are you, Larry? I hear at your beck and call as always. There Dave you and Jens, it's good to be with you today. Got My that God. radio voice. <laughs> yeah, you got chops there, man. Yeah. I mean, here's a we got a legend in this industry here. Why don't you just give people a little <laughs> couple sentences about what you do? I really, I do three things. I help people get jobs. I help them improve their skills and I help them keep clients happy. My job is really to improve filmmakers' business and creative skills. All right. Mm -hmm. And not to mention your show. Why don't you a little plug your show? I know you always let me plug mine. Well, I want to instead plug my website, which is LarryJordan.com. And the main reason is we put the show on hiatus for the summer, and I'd rather you get something which is instantly available. So if you go to LarryJordan.com, you'll find hundreds of hours of training and thousands, literally th thousands of tutorials covering Apple and Adobe products that can answer questions on how all this stuff works. Well, I got to say, you've certainly done, uh, <laughs> I thought we did a lot to sort of help educate the indie film community, but we haven't done anything compared to what you've done. Mm -hmm. I've even been on yeah, three or four of your You have shows. a life, Steve. That's the big difference is that I, uh, my, <laughs> my whole job is, is right. I, in fact, I was just looking at it. I've written 1,974 technical articles and I've done 2,115 video tutorials. So mm -hmm. that's over since 2003 when just after Final Cut 7 was announced. Wow. And yet you've not been on our show. We suck. Yeah, right. Okay. Well, we're making up for it now. We are. Okay, let's introduce our next guest, which is Tanner Schnick. Oh, Schnick. Schnick. Schnick, yes. Okay, yes. Schnick it is. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, why awesome. don't you tell us a little bit about you, Tanner? Yeah, so I'm an Atlanta-based freelance director of photography and documentary filmmaker. So I spend most of my time um, DPing commercial um, commercials for brands like Home Depot and Google, then also in my free time, in between projects, I'm also working on documentary films, and that's kind of where my passion is in the filmmaking world. Yeah, that's kind so of I've been navigating this freelance scene for a while now. It's been fun. Okay, great. Now I want to introduce Rachel. She's our social media director, and she's going to be moderating the show. I am. Hi, everybody. I will be following the chat as usual, taking your questions to pass along to our guests, and generally chatting around in the Facebook comments. Our title today is How to Be a Successful Filmmaker. We're focusing on modern storytelling and storytellers as a mix of creators and marketers. So if you know how to good story, but you can't tell a good story, but you can't run a business, at the end of the day, your family probably still needs to eat. So let's post <laughs> your questions and comments. And as we go about running a filmmaking business, we'll get to as many as possible. All right, let's go for it. All right, Jens, I told you that Rachel was gonna say something and then we'll know what to do. Mm -hmm. Now that was actually Larry's line uh, there we go. It was. We stole it. Yeah, we stole it. And and right. I want to get Larry up here to explain that line because it really is beautiful. That is, that sums up what you need to be able to do. If you can't feed your family, it, you know, it used to be. Then it's I, a hobby. You know. I yeah, mean, I read an article once that said <clears throat> that you can have a production company for the average production company lasts like five years and then life sets in. Mm -hmm. I think we've talked about this before. What do you say, Larry? Well, I think one of the key things, Steve, and just to throw the compliments back, about six months ago for the Digital Production Buzz, which was my podcast for years and years and years, I had you on to talk about it. And the very first thing you said as you slammed your fist down at a table is you said, creativity is not enough. Mm -hmm. And the more that echoed in my head, the more I realized how true that was. And I now play that interview for all of my classes of students who want to become filmmakers because creativity is not enough. You have to actually have three things. You've got to have be creative and handle the task of production. But that's the sexy part. That's what we get into filmmaking for, is to play with all the gear and work with the actors and tell the stories. But we also need to understand how sales and marketing work. And we also need to know finance, operations, and administration. And what I've learned is that filmmakers know one of these for sure, creativity. They may know two. They may know sales or marketing. But almost no one knows all three. And until you understand how finance and administration, how sales and marketing, and how creativity and production are all needed and they be able to have a successful company, until you realize that you can't do it alone, it's part of a team, then you're going to have a business that doesn't succeed. And what happens is two filmmakers 
two creative individuals get together and say, let's start a company. Well, the problem is they haven't solved the sales, the marketing, the finance, the operations, the administration, the legal, the taxes, the HR, all that stuff. They don't even know what they don't know, and a company fails. What you need to have as a successful filmmaker is, is not just creativity and not just technical skills and not just production, but the ability to understand you're running a business, a business that has employees, that has HR, that has legal, that has operations, that you've got inventory, all the stuff that none of us want to do. So what we have to do is build a team and the members of the team are able to fill in what we don't understand. And that, I think, is the core gap that filmmakers don't understand. And it was really, Steve, uh, one of the comments that you made in, in one of our many interviews on The Buzz that, that brought this so clearly home to me is, is I was saying, Steve, as I do to all my guests, I'm more than happy to have you promote your product and promote uh, all the great stuff that Zacuto does. And you said, you know, Zacuto's a great company. We make great products, but that's not what I'm focused on. I'm focused on enabling people in this industry to be successful. And that made me realize that, you know, there's a lot more here than just simply understanding which widget connects with what gadget and how to create a great looking image. Cause there's a lot more to being a successful filmmaker than that. That was like 99% my quote, but I'm going to, I'm going to clarify it slightly. Because what I've always said, and you could you could you'll back me up on this, mm -hmm. is that it the two people that you take to have your production company, one needs to be what I always call a businessman, and one needs to be a creative person. Remember in our first production company when we had Rick? Rick? Yeah. yeah. He was constantly looking for jobs while we were mm -hmm. doing jobs. He was glad to be in the office. He didn't well, he was desire a to be man. on the set. He, yeah. he had his other goal. And what was amazing is then well, all of a sudden we're still working on one and he's like, okay, you got these three to prep while you're working on one. Mm -hmm. And so many people, they say, well, I don't want you know to share the profit with them or it's me and a buddy. We got together and we're like, hey, let's do this. Mm -hmm. But we've, we have consistently, in every company we've ever had, and you've worked with me through three or four of them, right. it's always been either I'm the businessman or the director of the creative department, or you know, you've always been on the creative side. But it is absolutely essential, and I tell this to people, and they never, ever listen to me. Right. Can I interrupt for one second? Absolutely. More than any other industry, filmmaking is a collaborative, creative business. And so what we need to be successful is the ability to understand that it's a business, but more importantly, that it's a people business. And the people that are successful are those that can manage groups of people and can enable them to achieve a creative vision, which the director or the producer has. But our job is to motivate others to do that. And what happens is all too often we get focused on, is it DaVinci Resolve or is it Final Cut? Am I shooting at Aria or am I shooting at Panasonic? And those are the wrong questions. They're vital questions, they're important questions, but it's not at the heart of what makes us successful. What makes us successful is our business skills, our people skills, our creative vision, and our ability to focus on the job at hand and get new work. Well, it's interesting, because really the producer is the businessman on the set, or the mm -hmm. executive producer, and that, that's for that project. But then you have your business manager who, who runs your actual business. He's the business manager in your company. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we got Tanner. Now he's, this is a real interesting situation because a DP typically doesn't run a production company. So his business manager could be an agent or something like that. But I wanna find out, because I have a feeling that Tanner, you do some of your own production work as well. Why don't you tell us your take on this bizarre concept of making money in the film business and i'm going to put quotes on business mm -hmm. yeah i mean for me it's all about balance i think when a lot of filmmakers come out of film school and really start in this industry the whole aspect of it is just really romanticized they think they can be like a ryan coogler or wes anderson make their first movie then just skyrocket from there but it's really you know just a constant game of you know upping to the next client or building <clears throat> your business from there so I mean, for me, it's all about balance as a DP and balancing, you know, the commercial gigs because I'm more on the commercial side of it. So, you know, I'm booking a two or three day gig as opposed to a two month gig on a narrative side. So I also balance that with, you know, client work that I pick up on on my own. So, I mean, yeah, it's just balance and continu continuously building kind of that installed base of clients 
that you can always go to. So, you know, if the commercial gigs stop coming in for a month or so, your family doesn't starve. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an interesting point because like when, when we're in Hollywood and we're talking to cinematographers, ASC members, it's like you'd think all they want to do is be on a feature or be on a, uh, a TV show. And what do you hear, Jens? Mm. I want to be doing a commercial. Yeah. Because yeah. that's where the yeah, money yeah, that's is. Where most of the money you is, know, right? it's mm-hmm. like I thought it was a trick question there. Oh, a okay. <laughs> Trip me up. Trust Absolutely. me, the money is in commercial and corporate. My God, if you direct a commercial, you're getting huge pay, residuals, on mm-hmm. and on and on. Now, if you're directing um, television, you may get the same stuff. But as a DP, you're just a paid guy on that set, which is mm-hmm. lovely. Yeah. Well, and then we get back to that very first video we ever made at Secudo, which was Film Fellas Episode 1, mm-hmm. where I asked people, would you rather do a, you know, weddings and work on corporate work and make money and do your independent film one a year or work at Starbucks and do your one independent film a year? And I don't know why, but people all said they would rather not shoot a wedding or a corporate job mm. and it, like it was somehow demeaning. I've never really kind of understood that thought process. I mean, corporate work, like, yeah, it's not usually the most glamorous or things, you know, you want to flood your Instagram feed with, but I mean, typically they pay well and they can be rewarding. And the, the best thing about it is you can really hone your skills and yeah. hone your craft more in those scenarios. You know, you can really learn how to craft the perfect key light on a subject or, you know, really, get your backlight in or maybe try a different lighting style, then that will flood into your commercial or your narrative work and kind of improve you there as opposed to, you know, another avenue. Yeah, I mean, it's it's what you always say, Jens, it's experience. I mean, uh, yeah, right. Absolutely. You, no, I mean, yeah, you're in the grind there and you've got to be efficient. You mm-hmm. got to, you learn a lot from doing those things constantly. It's errors. It's mm-hmm. like, why would you want to work at Starbucks and not have the opportunity to have errors. Errors mm-hmm. is where you learn. Successes are fun. You learn nothing. How about that, Larry? I think this speaks to something that film students have to wrestle with a lot. Uh, and that is they think they have to go to film school to learn how to create a film. And what you really do is you go to film school to network, to develop the connections you need that'll last you through the rest of your career because you learn how to create a film by creating films. It is by actually going out and shooting and critiquing it and working with actors and and discovering what you don't know and how to solve problems that you learn how to create films. Film school can accelerate that perhaps, but really it is the actual process of the creative creation of a film, which is what you were just referring to, that makes all the difference. I was reflecting as you and Tanner and, and Jens were talking about the business side of filmmaking. And I, I pulled up an article from my website and I discovered that I had seven rules. Uh, can I share them with you if I promise to be quick? Absolutely. Rule number one on running a successful business. The difference between a hobbyist and a professional is that the professional expects to get paid for their work. It's not a question of quality. It's not a question of gear. It's a question of cash. Rule number two, and students have a hard time believing this because they're so easily <clears throat> taken in. But rule number two is working for free does not pay the rent. (laughs) And so often producers will say to a a student, work for me for free and you will develop such incredible contacts and you'll develop such an incredible thing that you can put on your resume. People say, wow, you worked for famous person number 23. And really all they want is free labor. I don't have a problem with internships. I have a problem with internships that don't have an end date. Mm -hmm. So work for free for like two or three weeks and after that, get paid. Never bid solely on price is the third rule because there's always going to be somebody willing to work more cheaply than you. The reason people should hire you is not because you're the lowest cost but because you have the best vision to help them realize whatever their goal is for that that project. Fourth, buying gear is easy. Finding clients is hard. Rule five, always buy gear with client dollars. Uh, My brother got into this trap for years and years and years. He was a professional photographer. And he would always say to me, if I just bought one more camera body, if I just bought one more lens, then the jobs will come in. (laughs) And it wasn't for, I would say, 30 years until he realized that jobs come in regardless of what camera body he's got or regardless of what lens he's got. 
And as soon as you start to get cash from a client, you can buy whatever gear you want. But until you get cash from a client, all you're doing is driving yourself deeper in debt. Rule number six, 50% of your job is people skills. 30% is creating stories and material you're given, and 20% is technology. Naturally, we all focus on technology because that's the sexiest part of our industry, but it's not where the bulk of the challenges are. <clears throat> and finally, within reason, never buy gear in anticipation of getting work. Get the work first, then get the gear. So I thought I'd share those and see if you agree uh, or disagree with any well, of those. Well, yeah, I'd no, like those. to thank our guest because our show's over now. He <laughs> yeah. just wrapped the entire thing you up. Have, you have wrapped it up. Right. Okay, no. I want to go back to what Tanner said. And uh, the idea here is that we, when we had a production company, we sought out to, to find industries that we wanted to do sexy work with. Mm -hmm. So like we did a lot of work for what, 15 years with Jim Beam brands. And mm. people think, oh, Jim Beam brands, that's not gonna be very fun. Mm. Oh my God, remember we we, yeah. we did a scene out of the 1700s uh, that was- Reenactments, uh, and then a documentary essentially on the whole company, I mean it was- Beautiful shots yeah. you lit in these rack houses with camera moves and, and it was like making movies. So mm -hmm. like we tried it in the 80s and 90s, but people now are doing this. They're making corporate work like mini films, mm -hmm. just like they're doing weddings. Man, we see these people that do weddings and it looks like, like a romantic comedy or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're incredible. Find the work and do what Larry says. Don't, don't go out and, and, and go on price. Go mm -hmm. on vision. Say, I, say yeah, you can, get, you can buy anything for low cost, but this is why I want to do it this way, and this is why I think it'll be effective, and this is why I think you may get more business and customers. Mm -hmm. And if you can show them some of that work, you know, so occasionally a spec job might, at least at the beginning, might be prudent. Which we did when we entered the fashion industry because there mm -hmm. was no fashion industry at that time. Tanner, how, what's your feeling on that? Well, I think one mistake that we make as filmmakers is we're visionary people. So we can see an idea in our head before we ever put it to paper. But a lot of times clients aren't like that, and we make that a false assumption that they are. So as a filmmaker or a creative, you really have to hone your presentation skills to be able to pitch effectively to these clients so that they can see that vision. And if you're able to present those ideas effectively, you're more likely to get that buy-in, then you can actually do those creative projects for them. So it's really just about communication and communicating your ideas and your creative ideas to a client, you know, thoroughly mm -hmm. and fully so yeah. that they can see that vision. A lot of times they don't have the imagination for it. They almost have to see exactly what they want in huh. one of your former projects, which is unfortunate, but yeah. uh, inevitably that's the case. Well, no, let me disagree. I think that's extremely fortunate. Otherwise, most of us wouldn't have work. <laughs> True. If you think about it, the, a corporate client <laughs> has a business which is not filmmaking. And just as they Absolutely. would hire an expert to come in and do legal analysis or an expert to do financial, they hire experts to do visual communication, to tell stories with pictures. Why should we expect a client to have the same vision that we do? And if they did, why would they hire us? I want clients to be as, as um, visually illiterate as necessary so that we as filmmakers can get work. That, that leads me to this point. And, and I, I don't want to sound like we're full of it, but we've always been dedicated to creating markets. So you don't have to like bid on a job. You know, you can come up with a concept and pitch a new idea. Mm -hmm. This right now we're trying to sell and I'm not pitching this or hawking this, mm -hmm. but we have three stages here and we're trying to sell companies on creating live shows exactly like this to create a conversation and get people to live on their website at a certain day and time and be able to have a conversation with their customers that they're interested in. We're not selling equipment here today. We're not doing any of that. Yeah. So this is a new market that we want to try to create. In, in the early 80s, I had this idea about putting point of purchase videos in department stores with fashion. But there's a component that we didn't have back then, and I want to get Rachel on right now. And that component was this idea of marketing. Mm. In the 80s and 90s, there was no marketing. You, you ran an ad or something. you know. But now, yeah. Rachel, this is your baby here. How do you use this, the internets, as I like to call it, as an old man, mm -hmm. <laughs> and use it to your advantage? One of the main things with 
social and including Vimeo and YouTube in that and keeping a website would be um, being realistic about what it is you want to get out of it and how much time you are willing and have available to put into it. So if you're going to use social media and your website as an extension of your reel and, um, and that's what you're putting out there, then you don't need to be on every single possible social platform out there. You probably just want to be on Instagram and Vimeo, maybe a couple of other places. But if you're using it for something bigger than that, if you want to become an affiliate for a second source of income, if you want to do reviews, if you want to make content that people care about, you need to be everywhere and you need to be willing to put the time in it. It's a full second time job. So you just have to be realistic about what you're looking to get out of it. Unless you are the luckiest person in the world today and you magically go viral for something totally random, which most of the time is unpredictable, unless you're hiring someone in PR, you are going to have to put a solid amount of time into it. And I think that's what a lot of people get stuck Mm. on is they don't see their numbers going up and, you know, they think they're putting out content that people want to see, but they're not actually investing any time in it. They're just throwing a picture up here or putting up something random there and they're not really crafting a story for themselves properly on the internet because they don't have the time to do it because they're a one man band. Here's how I'd use that internet. I mean, I don't know. I look at it and I would find some sort of a, a, of a niche that you want to really explore. I want to like go into Facebook groups with these end of life issues and try to develop a show, you know, with one of these Facebook groups. I've been thinking that all these topics that you just know nothing about until it's sprung on you. It would be great to have regular content. So there's a market that you could create a niche for if you could get in some kind of a group where, or, you know, and now you have the whole possibility of Steve, sponsors. Steve, 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 what, what, Steve, what? Steve, oh my goodness. What is the big flaw in your argument? I don't have a flaw. I'm going to do it, but go for <laughs> <laughs> Ideas are a dime a dozen. The question is all in the implementation. And it's, it's like Rachel was talking about. Rachel was discussing the fact that we need to be on Facebook and we need to be on Instagram. We need to be on Vimeo. We need to be on YouTube. But if you want to have your business take off virally, you've got to be everywhere all the time and 24 hours a day and no sleep and no food and just service the social media, which is a whole separate speech because I'm variantly against social media. The whole business that we have is built on relationships. People who know not only who we are, but know what we know. For instance, Tanner. Uh, I've heard Tanner's name before, but I didn't know what he knew and I wouldn't hire him because, fine, I know his name. I know lots of people's names. But now that I know what he does, and now that I know what his skills are, he's infinitely more hireable. And look at look at the projects that you work on, both Steve and Jens. You don't hire people just by reaching into a bag and pulling their name out of a hat. You need to talk to them. You need to find out who they are and what they know. Look at the first question you asked both Tanner and myself. Who are you and what do you know and what do you do? <laughs> Social media is is simply an amplifier of the voices that we already have. Which means that as filmmakers, to be successful, we have to do more than just simply post our thoughts on Facebook or post a video to YouTube. We've got to build relationships. We've got to find a way to get out there and meet people face to face in some meeting or network or anything. But to get in contact because that's how you're going to get employed. Uh, uh, can you imagine, Tanner, doing a documentary where you never meet the subject that you're interviewing? You just simply throw up a Skype camera and say, tell me what you know. Of course not. You'd get absolutely zero kind of answers. Although that's what we're doing right the now. Subject. you you got to talk <laughs> to the person. you got to get in depth to get the answers you want. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with Larry, yeah. although I think times have maybe changed a little bit where I think a lot of people do hire from what they see that's posted or you know their content. And uh, maybe an interview over the, over a Skype or something like that because uh, they can't get you know face to face unless you're counting Skype as face to face perhaps. Well, know. I'm I'm not. What I was talking about is okay. I'm talking about sales. What I think Larry's talking about is getting a getting <clears throat> jobs or getting on a yeah, job. Right. I don't ever mm-hmm. want to do that. But then again, that's just me. I want to create a market. I don't want to have to compete against anybody. Right. 
I want to own end of life issues for a while. First in, you own it, you know? So create a market, get a gig, get on a gig. There's three different topics we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. Tanner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would absolutely agree. The, uh, some of my favorite projects, actually my favorite project was just kind of a market that nobody was getting into, kind of like what you were talking about. And I just made something happen. And I think that's just part of being a filmmaking entrepreneur as well as, you know, sometimes you're just not satisfied with that status quo or the stories that are being told, or you're tired of waiting for jobs to come to you. And you just say, screw it. Like, I'm going to go out there. I'm going to make my own market, make my own content and make an audience from there. So, I mean, having that skill set as a filmmaker also translates over to the business side as well of being that entrepreneur. Yeah, I see Larry wants to say, what are you thinking, Larry? I think if we were risk averse, we would never become filmmakers in the first place. So I think built into the fact that we want to tell stories with pictures, visual communication, whether that's films or television programs or commercials or whatever, is that we and we actively embrace risk. We actively embrace the challenge of looking at a blank sheet of paper and trying to figure out how to put something on it. This is built into our psyche. It makes us who we are. So it doesn't surprise me at all that we want to find new markets, whether it's Tanner or Steve, or, or we want to find new ways of telling old stories. That's, that's just why we are who we are. But in addition, we still have to pay the rent, and we still have to, to earn a living. And maybe that's working at Starbucks during the day and doing our independent films on the weekend. Maybe it's hiring a business partner to, to beat the bushes for us. But I think we can't lose sight of the fact that, that it's a two-sided equation. Steve, it's a great idea to own end of life, which I think is just the weirdest concept, just the <laughs> phrase that I've ever heard. But owning end of life is just a wonderful concept. But why if you can't make money at it? Oh, I now, want to make money at that, it, yeah. It may, it may be that you're not interested in making money, and that's a perfectly valid thing. That You just want to do it because you have a love for the subject, and there's a reason for that. That ain't But me, you want man. to be able to make money at it. Well, yeah, obviously, but the point is, <laughs> is if everybody is interested in this end of life topic, then you need to go to the people that supply things to end of life and come. say, I have, get, okay, so this goes to a concept that I call it my forum, okay, so, or a mall. In other words, a mall or a forum is a place where you gather people. If I build this forum and I bring all these people who are interested in end of life issues and I'm not going to end of life sales things, pill companies, uh, nursing care, you know, all that stuff. yeah, you know, those walkers, all this kind of stuff and getting them to either sponsor my show, advertise on my show, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. I'm an idiot. That's the whole point of creating a market. That's what I'm getting yeah, at, that's, Larry. That's how I actually funded my first documentary. It was about the competitive llama showing industry. And so what I did is I knew that all these interest groups, like you know the Northwestern Llama Association, had a yearly meeting. So I would fly out there, pitch them the whole idea of what I was doing, then ask for money. So I mean, that kind of sounds exactly like what you're wanting to do with your project. Yeah, I think I disagree with that. Well, I think there's a risk with that. Let me put it differently. I think there's a risk with that. I get, I get email every day and I get physical mail multiple times a week from yet another financial planner who is throwing a dinner, who wants to get together to talk about what's happening with Social Security, invent the subject du jour. I know that the hook is to learn about Social Security, but what it actually is is a sales pitch. If, Steve, all you do is you create a mall or a forum and all it is is a sales pitch, why would I even be interested in going? What makes you a credible pitchman? You know nothing about the subject, as you've already told me. All you've done is you've just aggregated all these people that are selling end-of-life solutions. Mm. You have no credibility and you have no integrity, not you yourself, but this concept, because all you are is a sales organization. My perspective is that you need to provide valid information first and sales second, not sales first and then maybe tag the information on later. Oh, no, no, that's exactly what I want to do is what you're saying. You create words, a credible show first. This show was very valuable at teaching filmmakers, uh, you know, interesting ways that we've all gone about making money. All of my end of life shows, it would be shows like this that talk about 
uh, my mother is wandering out of the house. What are ways I can keep her from doing that? That's the show. Now, you subtly may slip in, you know, various drug companies, lock companies, you know, whatever, that these people that relate to that topic, but it's certainly not a sales pitch. We're not pitching our gear today. You know, people can sniff out that kind of thing. You have yeah. to have a real show first. It's something that provides real answers for people. We want to do what we do. You and I give valuable information. But, okay, but now let me just push back at you. I agree 100%. That's exactly right. But what was the very first thing? I've got this idea for an end-of-life show. I'm going to own end-of-life. And then I'm, I'm going to get all these sponsors together. I'm going to make so much money. The very first thought you, want, you had was not how do I engage people intellectually? How do I get them to buy into who I am? But it was instead how do I turn this into a sales opportunity? And I think there's a, there's a danger there in that we become essentially just pitch people, not pitch people with integrity. I'm not saying you, Steve, because that's not who you are. I'm just reflecting back on your comment. Yeah, that's fair enough. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, some people may uh, uh, not do that in a quality way and do it for that end goal and not make a good show. But that's where the, 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 the good ones will survive and the crap ones will fail. But the point being under all this is that it's another way to make money. You know, I mean, in mm -hmm. the film business or related. Yes, creating yeah. markets. It's, so right. we're going to get back. There is creating markets. There is bidding on jobs. There is getting on jobs. Right. I myself like the creating market route. Larry, I'm going to go back to what you said. This is a business of risk takers. You know mm -hmm. I have said this to both actors, producers, and directors. Sometimes I want to know where their brain's at. I'm like, okay, here's obsessive compulsive, mm -hmm. and here is bipolar. Just tell me which part of that spectrum you're in yeah. <laughs> so I know how to talk to you. Yes, right. Okay? Yeah. You are 100% right, Larry. We are psychopaths. Why would we do this? Because of the risk. And we love this. I want to give, I want to give each person uh, a last word. What would you say, Larry? Except that I'm a psychopath. <laughs> no, I would never say you were a psychopath. I'd say slightly demented, perhaps, and even leaning crazy, but never a psychopath. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for that. I think, I think I have three thoughts. One is acknowledge the fact that we love risk. Acknowledge the fact that we don't know what we don't know. And never give up. Mm -hmm. Okay, Tanner? When we first got into this field, I don't think when we told our families we were getting into filmmaking, they were like, hey, that's a fantastic career choice. Great job. Right next to a doctor. <laughs> I think there was always that hesitation like, oh, how's my son going to make money? He's going to be living at home when he's 30. But, I mean, risk is rewarding and risk is fun and you have to embrace it. And if you don't embrace it, that's how you'll fail. Mm -hmm. That's brilliant, right. dude. All right, Rachel, we're going to let you wrap us out. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you guys for a great show. A uh, big thank you to ICANN, who provide all the lighting for our show, and to our sponsors, Canon, Road Mics, and Kessa Crane. We will see you all in a couple of weeks with a new show. Bye. Have a good day.